Bachman up to the front. Thank you for joining us. Wonderful. So the microphone that's closest, that's between you, that's the one you're going to fight over. Uh, Lori, Jim's got the size. Look at that. He's already got it. I've got it. You know, I, 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 off right James, now, I, I have. Oh, it's, it's off. Okay, there we go. I have to say this already. Uh, of course, uh, Jimmy and I are buddies here. Okay, we played together in Winnipeg for a lot of years and uh, seven years, and uh, we're part of the Ottawa Senators alumni and stuff. And Paul, I'm like James. I unfortunately missed your presentation, but you can tell who the academics are in the crowd. Okay, <laughs> Paul's got the nice suit on. Jimmy's a professor at Algonquin College. He's got the nice suit on, and I come very casual and stuff. So you can tell that right off the bat. Uh, I'm a dean. Oh, a dean. Oh, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, no, and Laurie is uh, much shorter than I am, but when he has a hockey stick in his hands, he's about seven feet tall. <laughs> so we're going to be on equal footing. And I gave you lots of room when we played oh, with the Jets, too. <laughs> All right. Yeah, but but I will say this though. I see a lot of gray hair out there. I see a lot of gray. I'm legally deaf. I read lips. So if you're going to ask questions later on, we obviously we want to have questions. Use your big boy voice when you ask the question. And uh, there might be some other people who wear hearing aids in the audience based on the hair color. And if you don't, know, maybe you should get your hearing tested anyway. But anyways, thank you. All right. So let's introduce these guys properly. So Jim Kite was drafted 12th overall by the Winnipeg Jets in 1982, skating with the Jets, Pittsburgh and Calgary over the next decade before signing with the expansion Ottawa Senators in 1992. He later saw action with the San Jose Sharks. After his playing career ended, he became a columnist for the Ottawa Citizen and before joining the faculty, and then sorry, joined the faculty at Algonquin College, which he's already mentioned a little bit, and I'm sure will come up again. The other less known fellow, is Lori Boschman. See, the gyms are sticking together here, so <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, Lori Boschman was the ninth overall choice of the Toronto Maple Leafs. We still, we still. <laughs> okay, keep it down, keep it down here. Yeah. 1979 uh, NHL draft entry, uh, and he would put in brackets. We won't hold that against him. Uh, and played most of the next three seasons in Toronto before being traded to the Edmonton Oilers at the 1982 deadline. He's best known for his years with Winnipeg, with whom he registered 152 goals, 227 assists, and 1,338 penalty minutes over 526 games. He was then traded to New Jersey in 1990 and was claimed by the Ottawa Senators in the 1992 expansion draft, so obviously the best part of his career. Uh, he served as the first captain of the modern day Senators. Wonderful, so thank you and welcome again for taking time out of your long weekend to join us, guys. And I'm sorry I'm behind you, I know it's a little awkward, but don't feel like you have to look at me. Uh, so, yeah, yeah look at one. <laughs> now I feel really silly. All right, so Lori, we're going to pick on you first. Lori, you were born in the thriving metropolis of major Saskatchewan. Walk us through the path that took you uh, to being drafted in the first right. round in 1979 uh, by the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, first of all, do we have any uh, folks here from uh, Saskatchewan? Anyone from, no, okay, because I, I travel around uh, the country quite a bit and, and into the United States uh, with what I do, my, my full-time job. And uh, when I'm in Saskatchewan, of course, people know where places like Major and Corrobert and some of these places. One of my favorite places is bigger Saskatchewan, where Ron Greshner is from. Ron Greshner played before Jimmy and I did, <coughs> married a supermodel, uh, Carol Alt, uh, I think who's uh, uh, dating... Uh, uh, Yashin, uh, Lexi Yashin, they've been uh, partners for a number of years, but Bigger Saskatchewan, you go into Bigger Saskatchewan, it says New York is big, but this is bigger. <laughs> Home of Ron Greshner, I love that. Anyways, so, uh, you know, I was, uh, y you know, like maybe some of you here, because you guys are, uh, y y you know, you, you love the sport of hockey, you're hockey historians. Um, uh, I, I just grew up in Saskatchewan, uh, one of five kids in the family. Um, uh, I have a brother and three sisters, and uh, I mean Saskatchewan's cold. And uh, back in you know uh, in 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 our day, uh, I'm 56 years old, and and uh, as Jimmy said, some of you have gray hair, so you understand that it's not like we're talking to 17-year-olds who don't understand that the World Wide Web wasn't around when their parents were around. You guys understand there was no you know World Wide Web. There was uh, TV, two channels out Western Canada, CBC and CTV. So we were outside all the time doing all kinds of stuff and uh, I played hockey 
out on the ponds uh, out in Saskatchewan. Uh, in uh, we lived in some small towns you you've never heard of in Saskatchewan. Very very small towns. In fact, if you want to just Google it for fun, Major Saskatchewan. I think there's 67 people that live there. So there's as many people in this room as as in in the community where. I was born, I was actually born in Corrobert, which is 30 miles away because that's where the hospital was, but we were living in major Saskatchewan. And um, when I was nine years old, my folks moved east from Saskatchewan to Manitoba, Brandon, Manitoba, uh, where there was a junior hockey team, the Brandon Wheat Kings, and you guys being hockey historians know that that's a, a, a team in the Western Hockey League. And um, so my sort of dream, if you would, was to play hockey at the NHL level. Never ever thought that I'd make it, but that was my dream. Like. Jimmy's and, and like maybe some of you and um, when I was uh, 16 years old I got a chance to try out for the tier 2 team uh, the Brandon Wheat Kings they were called in fact uh, uh, if you're a hockey historians you might know this name Andy Murray he was my first coach Andy Murray was a coach in the National Hockey League for a number of years and he was my first coach uh, in tier 2 hockey then the next year as a 17 year old I tried out for the Brandon Wheat Kings I made the Brandon Wheat Kings. We had a former NHL defenseman by the name of uh, Dunk McCallum as our coach, and uh, and uh, we had a, a very strong hockey club with played with uh, on a line with uh, Brian Prop and Ray Ellison and Brad McCrimmon was uh, uh, on defense. We ended up going to, uh, as many of you know, the Memorial Cup opened up yesterday, and uh, down in Windsor, and uh, we went to the Memorial Cup that that year. We were the representative from the Western Hockey League. And we lost to the Peterborough Peets in overtime uh, in the Memorial Cup in uh, Verdun, Quebec, 2-1. Uh, and a uh, defenseman by the name of Bob Atwell scored uh, the winning goal. And uh, so after, after that, I went back to Brandon. And uh, I, I actually, uh, that's when the NHL draft was going to be held. Uh, and, and that in 1979, actually, that's when the World Hockey Association disbanded. And four teams from the World Hockey uh, joined the NHL to, to make it a 21-team league. So that's when uh, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Hartford, and Quebec joined the NHL. And uh, I went back to Br Brandon, and uh, they had the underage draft, and I was an underage player. And, uh, and I got drafted that, uh, that year. Great. Thank you. Jim, you're an Ottawa boy. <laughs> Describe your journey from the Canadian capital to being drafted in the first round by the Winnipeg Jets in 1982. Uh, well, I'm from a family of five boys and one girl. All the boys, including my dad, uh, were hearing aids. Uh, but it was, the natural thing to do in my neighborhood was to play ball hockey or road hockey. Like, we all wanted to fit in. And now, I'll give you a quick synopsis of my, my hearing. So I'm profoundly deaf, meaning I have a 100 decibel loss out of 115. 100 out of 115. I'm orally deaf because my mother made sure and my father for the most part, but my mother fought the school board. They wanted to send all the boys to Belleville, to the Belleville, the Ontario School for the Deaf, and back in the 50s, I think it was called the Ontario School for the Deaf and Dumb. And, um, you know, we've come a long way since that time. So we had to sit in front of the class and do well in school. But when I played hockey, I was three years of age and I was outfitted with a hearing aid that was strapped to my chest and the buckles were in the back and I couldn't take it off. And the wires came up underneath my uniform, underneath my equipment, and into my ears. And as you know, Lori and I, when we first started playing, and many of you guys, uh, just a helmet, no facial protection. But as soon as you stepped on the ice, you got hit. And uh, you know, you learn how to take a hit and give a hit at a very young age. And uh, but for a kite boy to play hockey, because my hearing aids, the amplification was really in the ear part. I'm wearing two hearing aids now, but the, because of technology, they're very small. You can't see them, but. Uh, mine really protruded and for you could almost identify a kite boy on the ice because that's the kid with the blood coming out of his ears but that uh, and so we would get hit all the times and the the hearing aid was really hard plastic and you just jam into your ear and uh but that was just the price to play hockey it was part of the game it was part of the game so um and uh, so anyways, I worked really hard and uh, I'll, you know, next thing you know, it's a junior and our mid midget. And, uh, no one was more surprised than me. I, was, I got drafted first overall in the Central Junior Hockey League by the Hawkesbury Hawks. The coach there was, uh, was uh, Mac McLean. Best coach I've ever had, taught me more than anybody. He used to coach in Kitchener and Sudbury in the Ontario League. 
And uh, so I was a first round draft pick three years in a row. In a row. So first round to, Winnipeg, uh, to uh, Hawkesbury, then Cornwall. You mentioned the Memorial Cup. The last time the Memorial Cup was in Windsor, Cornwall had won the Memorial Cup. Uh, and um, with uh, you know, Dale Howardchuck and Fred Arthur and Fred Boimstruck and, and guys like that. And then um, uh, Doug Gilmore was not on that team. He was on the next team, which uh, I, did, I, I played in the first year that the, Ontario, that the Cornwall Royals played in the Ontario League. So Cornwall had won two Memorial Cups back to back. When I got drafted, <coughs> I just gonna think it's a, a cool story. When I got drafted, it was 1981. And now the draft happened on, on the internet, so you don't even go to the draft. But uh, we went to Toronto. I was rated in the first round. And uh, with my parents, I got called down to the table. I, I was uh, selected by the Cornwall Royals, uh, 12th overall. And the Ottawa 67s had the next pick. And I was kind of hoping, I grew up wanting to play for the Ottawa 67s. I don't know much around in Toronto were there, but I was a huge 67s fan. That was my dream. Uh, not to play in the NHL, just to play for the 67s. You know, with, uh, <coughs> with Denny Potvin and Doug Wilson and uh, all the guys that played. So, um, anyways, I got selected by Cornwall. I go down to the table, and Gordy Woods was the scout for the Cornwall Royals. He was considered himself as a sage uh, because he had drafted Dale and um, uh, he had won two Memorial Cups, and he never sat with any of the other scouts. So he never, never talked to anybody. He didn't want to share any information with the, with the other scouts. So I come down to the table. It's 1981, and Bob Kilger is the coach. And Bob was, uh, was an, a, a former uh, WHA NHL referee, and then he went on to become a member of parliament and the mayor of Cornwall. Now, if you know Bob, if you know Bob he, he's got a bit of a sarcastic wit, something like Laurie here. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, 1981, and he, I meet Bob, and Bob turns to Gordy right in front of me, and he says, I know this is the International Year of the Handicap, which is true, the United Nations International Year of the Handicap. Now, they, they've changed it to call it disability, because handicap is not a politically correct term, but I know this is the International Year of the Handicap, but aren't we taking this a little too far? <laughs> and Gordy says, what are you talking about? And he said, look at his ears. And Gordy looked over and saw my hearing aids for the very first time. He had no idea that I had a hearing impairment. Now, I think that's a really cool story. Mm. Uh, I wasn't offended by it, all, by it at all, because Gordy didn't, when he was sitting in the audience, in the stands, and he was watching, he judged me just like he would judge any other player. He didn't have any filters on as to what I, what he think I could or could not do. He just judged my performance without any, uh, any preconceived notions. So, um, that, so I ended up going, I was very fortunate to go to Cornwall because they had won two Memorial Cups and a lot of guys graduated to the NHL. So I came into a very young team and I was given a lot of opportunity to play. And then uh, no one was more surprised than I was when I was rated in the first round of the National Hockey League the following year. So I ended up getting picked by Winnipeg and uh, I was thrilled to be selected by Winnipeg and I flown out and I met John Ferguson and. And um, you know, they were the only team that actually flew me out before the draft, and so I was really looking forward to it, and yeah, it was great. It was a great start to a career. Wonderful. Thank you. All right, Laurie, uh, in order to make Kevin happy, I mean, uh, over at the same time, um, could you talk a little bit about being a rookie in the Leafs dressing room with Daryl Sittler, Tiger Williams, Ron Ellis, and hmm. Mike Palmatier? And was there one particular veteran who took you under his wing? Yeah, well, you know what, it, it, it's uh, like I'm sure Jimmy could say, uh, you know what, it truly is a dream come true. You hear this of all the players, uh, I, I, I don't care, um, you know, what era and, and that, because for those of us who, who, who love and play hockey, you kind of dream that, you know, you'd like to, to make it to the NHL, and you never really think you, you, you could do it. I never thought I'd ever play in the NHL, but I wanted to, and, uh, you know, I... I Every Saturday, just after Tommy Hunter back out, out west, we would uh, we'd watch Hockey Night in Canada, right? And uh, and I'd be there with my dad. But I was a Boston Bruin fan, so I knew you know Phil Spicito, Bobby Orr, Hodge, Cashman, all those guys, and I knew you know who Sittler and Ronnie Ellis and all those guys were as well. So I knew all the players in the NHL because uh, I don't know how many teams there were at that point. Uh, Might have been 17 or so. Anyways, um, so to 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 actually go to 
you know, the hallowed Maple Leaf Gardens and, and to, to play in Maple Leaf Gardens, or at least to, you know, get drafted. Uh, you know, the other interesting thing is, uh, as hockey historians, you would know that uh, when I got drafted in 1979, unlike uh, Jim, uh, when I got drafted and they had that amalgamation with the World Hockey and the NHL, I, after the Memorial Cup we lost, uh, I got a call from Hockey Canada to try out for Canada's Olympic program because in the summer of 1979, just like what's going to happen here in 217 as they get uh, ready for the Olympics in South Korea, uh, back in 79 they used non-NHLers, like non-professional hockey players. So I got a call from Hockey Canada that said we'd like you to try out for Canada's Olympic program. So my agent at the time, um, Alan Eagleson, um, <laughs> call, called me up and said, uh, uh, Laurie Hockey Canada would like you to try out and you're likely going to be picked as a, as a first round pick because uh, I was an underage player. So after, after we lost out the Memorial Cup, I went to Calgary, uh, tried out for the uh, Olympic team and while I was trying out for the Olympic team was the sixth round conference call that year in 1979. So we were doing two days at the time and myself and another former NHLer whose kids you would remember, Paul Reinhardt. Paul Reinhardt uh, has got a couple of kids in the NHL now, but Paul and I were the two players that were going to get drafted that Hockey Canada had asked to come and try out for Canada's Olympic program. Of course, in 1979 in Lake Placid, or 1980 in Lake Placid, that's when you know the Miracle on Ice, the Americans beat the Russians and, and uh, uh, with Herb Brooks and, and, and all that's history. So. Um, Anyways, we, we were down in the basement of the Calgary Corral uh, uh, where Paul Reinhardt and I, with a, an official from Hockey Canada, was there with a big old black telephone. And the deal was, is when we got drafted, they said, you know, you're going to get drafted. Both you guys are going to get drafted. The phone will ring. The ho official from Hockey Canada will pick it up and then pass it to you. So the phone rang. So we knew one of us got drafted. We didn't, you know, there was no TV. There was no internet, all that stuff. It was the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they picked you, Laurie Boschman, uh, Harold Ballard's on the phone. Like, I got picked in 1979, I was the ninth pick overall, so I, I talked to Harold Ballard, I talked to King Clancy, uh, Floyd Smith was my first coach, it was just like, whoa, like all this stuff. So, long and short of it, I had a decision made, and, and a few picks later, Paul Reinhardt got picked by the uh, Atlanta Flames, who the next year went on to be the Calgary Flames. And the, I'm not telling you hockey historians anything you don't know. So um, the, the difference between Paul and I is that I didn't want to play. I, I never dreamed of playing uh, in the Olympics. That was not something I even thought about. I never, but I dreamed about playing in the NHL. So I left Canada's uh, Olympic program a week later, went back to Brandon. Paul Reinhardt ended up staying. He went, made the team, went to Europe, and then after the Olympics, he joined the Atlanta Flames. And uh, I went back to Brandon, and then shortly thereafter went to my first training camp in Toronto. So getting to your question, James, so to be on the ice with Sittler and Salming and those kind of guys, Ronnie Ellis was unbelievable. In fact, this is a true story. They had a, um, a rookie camp, and after rookie camp, then they had the main camp. And so I made it past the rookie camp. I'm in the main camp now. and. You know, we had to dress in the in the visitors' dressing room, and then all the big boys who had played in the NHL last year came out the uh, the runway that uh, you'd you'd come out if you were a Toronto Maple Leaf. And so, I, I'm on the ice like this, and I see Daryl Sittler coming out, and then Ron Ellis and Tiger Williams, Boris Salmi, and honestly, I almost hit the end boards because I'm going like this, watching those guys come out like this, and I I just saw the goal line in time to make the turn because I would have hit the end boards. And, and I can just imagine those guys saying, hey, hey who's that donkey that just uh, ran into the end? That's your first round pick from Brandon, you know? <laughs> but, but anyways, when I got, uh, y y you know, I was just absolutely thrilled because I, I didn't really expect uh, that I would make the, the Toronto Maple Leafs, although you try and you do everything you want, but um, uh, when Floyd Smith told me that uh, Laurie made the team after the three-week training camp, the first thing I did was uh, I, I took a nickel, I, I went outside the, the, the uh, dressing room of the Toronto Maple Leafs, turned right, and there was a bank of payphones on that, and Kevin would know, 
uh, grown up in Toronto, and maybe there's some others uh, of you here in Toronto that uh, were at the old Maple Leaf Gardens. There was a bank of payphones. I put in a nickel and I called my parents collect and told them I made the team. Because Floyd Smith told me, go get an apartment, you made the team. So my first roommate that year was uh, Joel Quenville. Uh, and then, of course, Joel got traded with uh, Lanny McDonald to uh, Colorado for Wilk Paymont and um, uh, Pat Hickey. And uh, so then my next roommate was uh, Pat Ribble for uh, a month or so, and then Rick Vive. Uh, so I had three roommates my first year. But it was, a, it was an absolute thrill. I learned so much from Ronnie Ellis, from Daryl Sittler, uh, from Boria Salming in how to be a pro, uh, how to work. Uh, what you have to do, how to deal with the media, because I, I, I was a kid from, you know, from the prairies, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so you don't understand a lot of the, uh, the dynamics, but that's why you have veteran uh, players in a dress room today, or that's why you have veteran people in, in, uh, in, in, in any job you have, is to teach that younger generation how to be a pro, what it takes to, to do this line of work, how to deal with the media, which is always different. I got all kinds of stories about... Uh, uh, you know, I got tons of stories about uh, what happened in, in Toronto, but uh, so uh, how much time do you guys have? Well, we better, we better let Jim talk. Uh, Jim, let's talk about your time in Winnipeg a little bit. So you had a great team, but you were in the same division as the Edmonton Oilers. Can you tell us a little bit about that rivalry and what it meant for you on the ice? Um, yeah, it was obviously we were in the outsmite division one year. Laurie can probably correct me on this, but uh, I've had a few concussions in my career. Laurie, no, he's never had a concussion. He's good. Because uh, uh, I was always sticking up for him, so. Yeah, I yeah. Check, the pen <laughs> check the penalty minutes. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. Uh, anyways, um, yeah, so we, obviously, we, both Laurie and I played last October. We played in the Heritage Classic, the outdoor game, the alumni game between Edmonton and Winnipeg. And it was a thrill to go back. But, uh, you know, we felt that it was wonderful. We could have been playing anybody, but the fact that we were playing the Oilers made it extra special. Both the franchises came into the, into the NHL at the same time. The Winnipeg Jets won the last Abco Cup against the Edmonton Oilers when Gusky was there. And I didn't know this at the time, but Mark Messier's very first professional game with the Cincinnati Stingers was in Winnipeg. So he had a bit of a, a connection there. And so, but going back, uh, they obviously had a very, very good team. We had a pretty darn good team too. We had one year, we had uh, six players. One was Laurie. Uh, six players that scored 30 goals in one year, in, in one season. So we had a very uh, gifted offensive team, and, uh, but we could never beat the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, one year, they finished first overall, and I don't know if it was Philadelphia or Boston, they finished second overall. Calgary finished third overall in the league, and we were one point behind Calgary at fourth overall in the league. I remember we went on a tear of winning 21 or 21 games or something like that in a row, and so did Calgary. And we we didn't make any ground up on them. We were right behind them, and uh, but so the very first round, you had Calgary and Ottawa because of uh, not Ottawa but Winnipeg because of the the, the uh, divisional play, uh, playoff setup. We play 1-4, so Edmonton would play uh, Vancouver, LA, and then we had to play Calgary. We ended up beating Calgary, and then we had to go on and play Edmonton. So we had the, 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 the third and fourth overall teams in the league playing in the first round of the playoffs. In the next round, you had the first and fourth overall league team, uh, that should be a semifinal at least in the NHL, or a final. And uh, we just could never solve Grant Fuhrer, unfortunately. I remember one game in Winnipeg, we had shot them 46 to 20 or 18, and we ended up losing the game three or four to one. So Grant Fuhr definitely be deserved to be in the Hall of Fame. Uh, I thought we did a very good job at shutting down the team at times, but if you just gave them one opportunity on the power play or just a little opening, they had such an offensively gifted team that uh, you know they could exploit it. So. It was unfortunate. Um, it's almost, I was watching, you know, it almost fit, felt like the, at modern day Washington Capitals against the Pittsburgh Penguins. You know, the Penguins seemed to get the, the Washington's number all the time. So it was, um, it, it was frustrating, to be honest, but we knew that, uh, you know, they, they would go on and win the cup that year. Uh, a, 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 the cup winner came out of this, the Smythe division. It was either Calgary or, or uh, Edmonton. 
uh, for seven, six, six, six seven, out of seven years. Six out of seven years, except for the uh, in '86 um, when uh, Montreal. Montreal ended up winning it. So, uh, yeah, so it was a very competitive division to get out of, but it was wonderful hockey, really wide open, lots of fun to play. And um, just to jump forward, some people ask me, what's it like to play in the National Hockey League with, with the hearing impairment? Because the higher level of sport you play, the more important communication comes into it. And I just know that when I played the Edmonton Oilers, I constantly counted on the ice. If we're, I mean, I'm on offensive blue line, I was like, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, making sure they were all in front of me. And I went, one, two, three, four, oh, jeez. I look around, and there's Glenn Anderson. <laughs> Glenn Anderson or Mark Messier or Kirk Curry kind of trying to get behind me. My teammates on the bench are screaming, but I don't hear it, <laughs> right? So it's just one of, I constantly counted, make sure there was, we were on the road and the home team wore the white jerseys. We were in Edmonton, made sure that there was five white jerseys in front of me. But it was great hockey, very offensive, exciting to watch. And uh, um, I think, you know, if we're going to get into this, I think the trap should be outlawed. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you better call him Boucher. I've got his number here, Jimmy, if you want to tell him that. But, but anyways, you know, one of the things that uh, uh, I'm very proud of, uh, you know, as a former player and stuff with, especially with Jimmy, uh, I mean, with what, the, the fact that he's able to play at the highest level, play at the National Hockey League with the hearing uh, disability that he had, uh, I mean, he excelled for a number of years uh, as a National Hockey Leaguer. Um, and it, it's truly incredible. And then, you know, he got his, uh, he got his, uh, you know, education and he moved up and got, you know, he's a dean of uh, Algonquin College. So for what he's accomplished with that is truly remarkable because many times, unfortunately, and, and this is not, uh, but uh, s some of the players when they, when they, w when they get post hockey, they don't do so well uh, for a variety of reasons. But, uh, but Jimmy's, uh, done very well he's uh, transitioned very well and it's it's just great to see a, a former teammate and a friend and somebody that lives in this area we're part of uh, the Ottawa Senators alumni and uh, and uh, it, it's great to see him do so well even though I like to tease him so going uh, keeping in the vein of perceived uh, impediments if you will uh, the Ballard days are well documented in your time in Toronto mm -hmm. Um, it was probably pretty ridiculous. We've heard stories from other guests in the past, uh, particularly in Toronto last fall, um, of some of the, the things he did. But for you, he would often call you out, it seems, and uh, he was vocal about your faith right. um, and how that he felt that probably made you soft. But if we look at the numbers, you had 178 penalty minutes in your sophomore season and 159 before your trade to Edmonton in the third season. Uh, tell us about your emotions at that time in your life and career with that pressure coming from high right. above. Well, 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 let me, for those of you who don't, who don't understand, um, you know, I was a first round pick, of course, by, by, by Toronto. So I don't care if you're a first round pick by uh, any club. After a certain period of time, there's an expectation that you're going to start producing according to where you were drafted. And if you're a first rounder, you maybe have a little bit more time and patience by management, but eventually you've got to produce. So fortunately for me, I had a very good first year. Uh, the start of my second year, um, uh, well, it's kind of interesting. Punch in Lex, my, 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 my GM, my first GM and stuff. And so I, I, I go from Brandon to Toronto, and I sort of got caught up a little bit in the, in the life of an NHLer and all that kind of stuff. And so one time during the, uh, about the third, third month of the season, Punch in Lex brings me in the office and says, Lori, have a seat. And I was just like, oh, geez, like, you know, and he's got his fedora, because he always wore a fedora, and uh, he had his fedora on, on one of those caps. And, and Ballard's, uh, uh, like this in Maple Leaf Gardens, Ballard lived right in Maple Leaf Gardens, so his door is right there. You know, uh, the big black door is right at the end there. He walked right in there, and that's his, that's his condo. And, and the first door to the right is Punch Imlex, and he's the general manager. And so he says, Lori, he says, uh, you're having a good year, but you're, you're going out and partying too much, and you were at this place and that place and that place, and it's just like, holy cow, this guy's read my mail. So he says, you better, you know, you better cut that back. So, anyways, I had a very good first year by, you know, all standards, and uh, get into my second year, uh, and, and, and you know, um, I, I, you know, as as uh, s sort of as the hockey world says that I found religion. I didn't find religion. It's just that uh, I decided that my life was going to take 
uh, a different direction. And so I, I decided to do that at the end of my first year, and uh, I, I became a, a Christian, or as was described in the newspapers and stuff, I became a born-again Christian. And so as a result of that, there was a lot of talk within the hockey realm, okay, Boschman's got religion, now let's see how he plays. Because I get into my second year, and I got off to a pretty good start. I got into a fight in Quebec City with Robbie Fatorik. I gave him an uppercut, and I, I cut my finger right here. I went underneath the, um, the stands, and, and the doctors in Quebec City, they stitched me up, and we flew back after the game. The next morning, I wake up, and I've got my whole uh, arm is swollen up. Long and short of it, I, I go in to see a guy uh, Guy Kinnear, who er, was our trainer um, in, in Toronto, who was Harold Ballard's boat mechanic uh, up in the Muskoka. He was our trainer. <laughs> That's a true story. Kevin knows that. And uh, so anyways, they, uh, they sent me to the hospital. And so I had blood poisoning because they should have gave me a tetanus shot because your mouth is the dirtiest part of your body. And it had gotten the bloodstream and started going up my arm. And they were worried about it getting to your heart. So anyways... My second year, I only played 50-some games, and I, I didn't play that well. But now, internally, the coaches were starting to talk that, well, maybe Boschman's not playing well because... Oh, and I got mononucleosis as well that year. So now it's kind of like, maybe he's not playing well because he's got religion. So what happened now, my, my third year, uh, we start off in Toronto. And i, I got to give you all this background to get to the Ballard stuff. Uh, just to say how ridiculous this is, and I don't even know if Jimmy has heard uh, this story, but uh, anyways, the start of my third year, I wasn't playing well at all. And so it, it hadn't, I just wasn't playing well. It had nothing to do with my health. I recovered from the mono, all that kind of stuff. I was just off, but I was a first round pick. And the expectations are that now this is year three, you, you, you know, you better produce. So if you're from Ottawa here, it's kind of like Curtis Lazar. Curtis Lazar was here for a period of time and then he wasn't producing to the level that they thought and they just traded him to Calgary this year and that happens all across the NHL landscape. So anyways, uh, Mike Nikoluk now is the coach for, uh, for the team and uh, oh, and just before Mike Nikoluk took over as coach, uh, Punch Imlach that year took me back up into the office and uh, is kind of like, oh no, like I, I knew I'd been looking after myself and stuff and he, he brought me in his office and says, you know, Laurie, why don't you go out and have a few beer with the guys? You know, like kind of just go and kind of loosen up and all that kind of. So I said, oh, okay, punch. What, what is it? You know, like. So, anyways, uh, Mike Nicolak's the coach, and Mike Nicolak was the coach for the Philadelphia Flyers along with Freddie Shiro in '74, '75 when they won their Stanley Cups, right? So now he's the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Third year, I wasn't. I got off to a terrible start. Mike Nicolak comes into me. Uh, comes into the coach's room one day and says, uh, hey, yeah, uh, Bosch, uh, like I say, uh, I'd like you to go see, uh, and I'll just use Jim's name, uh, I'd like you to go see uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Doctor Jim Kite at, uh, at the, uh, I forget the name of the hospital, right close to uh, Wellesley. That, that Wellesley. I like the uh, Wellesley Hospital. Oh, okay. Uh, what's uh, what's uh, Dr. Kite do? Oh, he, he's our, our team psychiatrist. <laughs> oh, okay. I didn't know we had a team psychiatrist. So that was at 2 o'clock. All right. So after practice, I go get some lunch. I go over to Dr. Uh, you know, Dr. Kite. I sit down. We have a nice conversation for about an hour and a half. This is a true story. Two days later, okay, Mike Nikolak calls my dad in Brandon, Manitoba, and says, gets him at, at his work, and says, uh, Joe, yeah, like I say, it's uh, Mike Nicklock here. Uh, we sent uh, Lori on Wednesday to see Dr. Kite. Uh, he's the team psychiatrist, and we got the report back today, and the report said he's brainwashed. Is there anything you can do to help him? <laughs> so that's an NHL coach calling your dad his place of work. I mean, I wish that would happen today because I'd have a lot of money from M MLSE, <laughs> that's for sure. But anyways, that, and so what had happened from there is, I mean, it was just crazy. Um, we, we played one night, we were playing, I was, I was single, we were playing the, uh, the Rangers in New York. And uh, as Kevin would know, um, Dick Beddoes on CHCH was kind of like the voice back in the in 70s, 80s. He was kind of, and, and he had a pipeline with Harold Ballard. So 
uh, he was on TV. I, I didn't know this stuff. He was on TV in between the second and third period when we were playing the Rangers. And uh, Wendy Sittler was taping it on the VHS. So, of course, there's no DVD back then. And, and, and uh, so he, they were having a conversation about Boschman. Uh, what are you going to do with Boschman stuff? And Harold Ballard said, well, we're going to trade him or send him to the minors because he's got too much religion. So we flew back after the game to Toronto because back in, in those days we did the double prop job, the Converse 640, and, and Wendy Sittler put a note on the door for Daryl, turn on the VCR. So Daryl gets in at 2.30 in the morning, turns on the VCR, she's got it queued up to the interview. Next morning, the practice, sit. I, I get dressed in my underwear, sits there, sits his bosh, come here. And, and he was like dead serious. And I, I thought maybe something had happened with, uh, you know, with Wendy or the kids and stuff. And then he goes on to tell me what, you know, what Ballard had to say, that he's gonna trade me or send me to the minors because I've got too much religion. So Daryl was just saying, Bosch, just get ready because all the media is going to want to ask you about that. And so basically at, 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 the, at the end of the practice that day, you know, they were all, the mics were all there and stuff like that. And I just said, I, I think it's Mr. Ballard's ignorance towards Christianity that he'd make a statement like that. And so from there I got traded and they did the whole brainwashing thing and, and all that kind of stuff. And I've got all kinds of stories with regards to that. But my teammates were unbelievable uh, they, they were you know so supportive and helpful and 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 I was still the same player the same person it's just that uh, my life was different off the ice and uh, so nobody could quite figure that out so in, in a way that Jimmy is a trailblazer or was a trailblazer for those with disabilities uh, uh, I have a tendency to think that there wasn't a lot of individuals at that time as uh, being identified as Christians in hockey that went through some of those things that I did. And now part of what I do with Hockey Ministries International is we do chapel programs right across the, the National Hockey League and, and the hockey landscape for players who are interested in, in, in spiritual, and, and not, I shouldn't say spiritual, in Bible-based principles because it's not a spiritual exercise we do. And uh, that's part of what I do now with Hockey Ministries. We, uh, we run hockey chapels at the NHL and I'm uh, I coordinate that here from Ottawa, and uh, there's many players. We, we're in 40 different leagues. Uh, you can check it out uh, on, 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 you can Google it at hockeyministries.org and uh, find out where we're at. Uh, we run hockey camps and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, you know, we have about 2,000, 2,000 hockey players that went through uh, a, a chapel this winter in 40 different leagues. And so I, I so ironically, there's a lot of interest in in things of of, of God or things of if somebody loses a family member or they have something wrong with their marriage or kids. So it's it's not unlike things that uh, all of us sometimes have questions about. But that's what I do on a regular basis uh, uh, as well with hockey ministries. But that's sort of a long-winded story about Ballard. But I got a lot oh, lot more right, stories. <laughs> I would be remiss to not have a couple questions about the Ottawa Senators, given that uh, you're both charter members and uh, of the modern day franchise, of course. I don't think you skated with the original Senators. Um, but <laughs> your path to the Senators was a very different one. So um, Jim will, will ask you first. So you came as a free agent. Um, and I'm going to ask you what that was like. Uh, I know it was a very difficult season for the franchise. You know, it started with a big hurrah. And they won the the first game against the Canadians, and uh, literally on the cover of one of the Ottawa papers, it said, maybe Rome was built in a day. Uh, but of course, uh, that didn't exactly pan out that season. So, um, and after Jim talks a little bit about it, maybe you could tell us a bit about being named captain, in, and I think you were quite surprised when you, when you found out that you got acquired as well in the expansion draft. But right. Jim, uh, tell us a little bit about your experience. Well, my experience is very different from Laurie's in the sense, well, when I think about my career, I was really with the Ottawa Senators for a cup of coffee. Um, I spent, I was a, I played in Calgary the year before. I played 21 games because um, early in the season I ended up uh, breaking my hand in training camp, playing against the Canadian Olympic team. Uh, they were still playing, uh, when I was with Calgary, they were going on to, to the 92 Olympics, I think, in Albertville. So you we were playing a guy, I broke my hand on Joey Juno in an exhibition game in Lethbridge, Alberta. 
And then uh, I came back and I uh, got into an altercation and one of the big Mike Civic, the six foot eight linesman stepped on my hand. <laughs> Uh, with his, and I put, so I lost a bit of skin in my hand and I had to get it stitched up and I had to keep it above my heart the whole time and it was my middle finger. <laughs> it was all wrapped up so I'm walking around like this for a couple of weeks. And then uh, I came back and then I, uh, I broke my ankle and I still have two pins in my ankle today. So I only played 21 games and, uh, but I was looking for, I was, Really looking forward to playing with, with, with the Flames, but then they had a, a change in coach and Dave King came in. I ended up getting bought out of the last year of my contract and I became a free agent. And I knew Ottawa had a new team and I said, wow, wouldn't it be great to go back and play for my hometown? So I ended up signing, uh, because I didn't have a great year the year before, um, I ended up signing my first ever two-way contract because I really wanted to play in Ottawa. And uh, Rick Bonus was going to be the coach and Rick, uh, Rick, Laurie, and I, we go back to the Winnipeg days. Rick was the assistant coach, a player coach, actually, a player my very first training camp. And then he became uh, a player coach in the minors, and then he became the assistant coach in Winnipeg. So we knew him, and I thought, okay, well, Bones is going to be there. And anyways, it turned out uh, my ankle was very slow coming around, and uh, I ended up getting sent to New Haven. I called it Mill Haven. <laughs> After the penitentiary, yeah. yeah. So I didn't uh, really want to be there, but we had a very young team. None of the, you know, the Ottawa franchise was, uh, you know, really watching their their pennies that year, and none of the players except for one had been drafted for the for the team in New Haven. So uh, uh, we had one kid who, uh, Fergie, John Ferguson, was also with the team, and who would we were sort of called, part of Fergie's boys in Winnipeg. And um, he drafted a young kid named Radek Hammer, who was supposed to be the Paul Coffey, next Paul Coffey from <laughs> Czechoslovakia. Anyways, I ended up rooming with him uh, to take care of him. He was 18 years old, and he listened to, listened to Metallica all day and all night. <laughs> Thank God I can take my hair any day. <laughs> So, uh, in any event, I played in the minors, and I almost more more was the, the playing assistant coach with uh, Don McAdam, and I get, ended up playing four games with the big team. So, they won the very first game, and then they went on to lose, I don't know, Laurie would know exactly how many, but I ended up getting called up later in the season, uh, but it was really for a cup of coffee. I'm on the Ottawa Senators Alumni Executive, Laurie is the president, so I'm very proud to have played with the Senators. Uh, but in the overall scheme of my career, it was, uh, wasn't a highlight of my career. I was, I was disappointed that I didn't get an opportunity to play. But, uh, you know, people made decisions and you got to live with it. Well, I can say, James, it wasn't a highlight of my career either because when you only win 10 or 11 games, I forget what we won that year, it, it, it was really tough. It was the most difficult period of time in my 14 years. But I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there, though. Uh, I was with the New Jersey Devils, and uh, the last uh, seven years of my career, the last three contracts, I negotiated them myself because uh, I figured once salary disclosure came out, I didn't need Al Eagleson or Bill Waters to negotiate my contract and take 10% or whatever, so I decided that I could do it myself, so I did it. So a week before the expansion draft, I'm with the New Jersey Devils. Of course, Lou Lamorello, who's now with Toronto, was the general manager of the Devils, and, and Lou is great. I love Lou. And, uh, and I see him from time to time when he comes through town and always say hi, and he's just been extremely gracious. In fact, my first wife uh, died of cancer 11 years ago, and Lou had called me and, and said, listen, Lori, if you need any of our medical assistance with the Devils, just, just call me and we'll, uh, we'll look after it. And uh, I didn't take him up on that because we had great care here, but I mean, that just shows you uh, Lou looks after his players well. But anyways, a week before the expansion draft in, in, in the summer of 92, uh, Lou brings me in and says, Laurie, we're going to leave you unprotect unprotected in the expansion draft because that's the year Tampa Bay and Ottawa were coming into the NHL. And uh, he says, I talked to Mel Bridgman and to Phil Esposito and they're not going to take you. You should be fine uh, because we want you back here. He signed me to a four-year contract. I had three years left on my contract. So, so anyways, the day of the expansion draft, Nancy and I and our three kids were taken a plane from Newark to Minneapolis, Minneapolis to Winnipeg because we had our home in, in Winnipeg and we had a home in New Jersey. So uh, we're 
in Minneapolis, the expansion draft is now over. That's the day of the expansion draft. It's now over. Nancy and the boys are, you know, in gate five, getting ready to take our connecting flight uh, to Winnipeg. So I get on the phone, pay phone again, no cell phones, and I'm trying to get a hold of my parents, couldn't get a hold of them, tried a couple of buddies, finally got a hold of someone, I'll use Jim's name again, got my buddy, Jim, and said, hey, Jimmy, did you listen to the expansion draft today? Yeah, Bosh, yeah, yeah, you heard it. It's actually, Steve was the, the guy I called. And uh, so I said, did you hear my name in the expansion draft? He said, no, no, I didn't hear. Oh, I said, great, Steve. Well, no, that's fine. I said, I'll see you. I'm, you know, just uh, catching a connecting flight in Winnipeg. I'll see you, you know, in a, in a few days and stuff like that. So we touched down into Winnipeg. We, uh, you know, got our three kids. We're collecting two cartfuls of stuff and all that kind of stuff. And as all of you know, when you travel, they, you, you have that, uh, that form you fill out and you have to hand it to the security guy at the door. So we're going out the, the door here with our kids and carts and all that kind of stuff. And I hand the, the form to the, uh, to the, to the dude and, and uh, the, the security guy. And he says, hey, hey, Lori, you're back for the summer, eh? I said, yeah, 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 we're back for the summer. He says, hey, what do you think about getting picked by the Ottawa Senators? I said, what? He said, yeah, you got picked in the expansion draft today. I was like, really? And Nancy, Nancy was behind me and like, oh no. We, we gave him the card and say, he said, oh, I'm sorry to pass the news. I thought you might have heard. I said, no. We walked through the door and my teammates, Jim, uh, Ray and Don Neufeld were waiting. As soon as the, you know, the, door, the automatic doors go, Ray and Don Neufeld are there and Dick and Shirley Stevens are other friends. And they said, did you hear? And we said, yeah, Bill told us. <laughs> 30 seconds ago, it's kind of, and anyways, so that's how I found out. Then what happened after that, I, I, I get home uh, to a, you know, our house in Winnipeg, and of course, before cell phones, and there was a message from both Lou Lamorello and um, Mel Bridgman. Long and short of it is, is Lou Lamorello uh, called and said, Lori, we didn't see that coming. Ottawa picked you. Uh, and we want you back, what do you want us to do? And then the next call, I call Mel Bridgman, and Mel Bridgman says, you know, welcome to the team, all that kind of stuff. Now, I've heard from Lou Lamorello, he, he wants you back, what do you want us to do? Uh, I said, give us a couple of days. And long and short of it is, is uh, I, I got back to him two days later and said uh, to Mel Bridgman, and I said, Mel, I said, you make the decision and we'll be happy with it. If you trade us back to New Jersey, we'll be really pleased because, you know, a year later they won the cup. Um, but uh, I said, if you want to keep us, we'll be happy to uh, play for the Ottawa Senators and be on the expansion team. And sure enough, he decided to keep me. And so we said, okay, well, we uh, will be happy with that uh, scenario. But all that to say, it was the most difficult period of my 14 year career because it's no fun playing on a team that you don't have that talent or the ability to win a lot of games, and uh, that was very hard. I think as a captain, as an older player, uh, we had some good um, guys in the room, uh, Bradshaw, uh, you know, Dougie Smale, uh, these kinds of guys. So we had some veteran players. We had some guys that were, you know, high high picks from other teams that were just happy to be in the NHL. Uh, so if we didn't win, or sorry, if we didn't play hard, like compete we were going to get blown out. So I think that's something. And, and we didn't have a lot of bickering. There wasn't a lot of, and, and that was one of the things that I think was, was really quite good is that we tried to stick together and, and all those kinds of things. And so, but it was a very, but you know, it couldn't have been that bad because I, I've lived now in the community for 24 years. Uh, I mean, next year, 17, 18 season will be Ottawa's 25th season. Um, and uh, so my wife and I, uh, with our three kids, we just decided, Let's see what this is like after, because uh, after my first year, Ottawa bought me out of my contract. And uh, so we decided, well, should we go back out west, because we have some shoe stores out west, and should I get involved in the shoe business? But we didn't want to really do that in the retail level, so we said, let's uh, stay here. And my, my good buddy and friend Don Lismer asked me to, to do what I'm doing today, uh, be a director for Hockey Ministries. And so one year turned into three, turned into five, and then your kids are settled, and he said, this is a wonderful area to raise a family. We're going to stay here, even though we're both Saskatchewan people, and and you know if we need to get see family, we jump on a plane. So, thank you very much.
Uh, Jim, tell us a little bit about your life after hockey. So uh, Lori alluded to a bit, but if you could give us some details, that'd be great. Yeah, before I do that, I just want to, to acknowledge someone in, in case it doesn't get answered. John Ferguson played a very, very important role in both our lives. Like we, I really enjoyed John uh, Fergie, and um, I remember meeting him at the draft and first time, and his fingers were halfway up my forearm, and you never forget the first time you, you, you uh, shake John Ferguson's hand. So he was a very special person for us. And I'm, you should have figured out as soon as John Fergie was with the Ottawa Senators, he was going to pick you. So it shouldn't have been a big surprise. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, in, in my case, uh, after uh, New Haven, I was thinking about retirement. And I actually eloped uh, to Jamaica with my wife, and, uh, my wife Nancy. And uh, I came back, and lo and behold, I got a call from a guy named Bob Strum, who was a long-time Western WHL uh, general manager, I believe in Regina, and he said they were putting a new team in Las Vegas in the International Hockey League. And uh, they had this young kid named Radek Bonk, who was uh, lighting up, he's gonna, he's gonna be rated you know, with a very high draft pick, and they were gonna clip Malarchuk and poke you, Radek, and a, former, a lot of former NHLers. And, I, and my wife and I thought about, well, if I'm gonna play in the minors, let's play somewhere and have some fun. Right, at least it, but it sounded like we were going to be treated like an NHL club. Uh, we were going to be flying everywhere versus on the Iron Lung bus everywhere. And so we decided to go, and uh, I ended up signing a, a two year contract. So I, I was the captain of the team for the Las Vegas Thunder. We had the best record in pro hockey. And from there, the following year, we had the lockout. And Raddock had been selected by Ottawa. And then Alexi, and so he came back, and Radic, uh, Alexi Yashin came down, and we also had Manon Rayom on the team. So it was a very interesting dynamic, being the captain of that team. So, uh, and any, well, we can go on and on, but I, so from there, the lockout ended, and San Jose uh, ended up calling. And this is a true story. So I'm, uh, Andrew McBain and I played in Winnipeg. We got traded to Pittsburgh together. And uh, so I got Andrew to come to uh, Las Vegas. So we always played practical jokes on, on each other. So we had just arrived in, in, uh, in Denver. And uh, Colorado at that time didn't have a team in the National Hockey League. Uh, we just arrived in Denver, and I got into my hotel room, and the phone rang. And I picked it up and goes, hi, this is uh, Joe Will from the San Jose Sharks. And I said, F off, Boehner. And I picked up. <laughs> <laughs> and I hung up. <laughs> and then, and then, literally, like two minutes later, uh, the phone rang again. He goes, uh, "Yeah, this is uh, Joe Will from the San Jose." And I said, "Bainer, like, really? Come on!" And then he goes, "No, this seriously. This is Joe Will from the San Jose Sharks." And I said, "Okay." I said, "What's your phone number?" So he gave me his phone number, and uh, so I called him back. And anyway, so it's, it's, I called him. It was a San Jose number. I said, "Holy cow!" <laughs> <laughs> So I signed in San Jose, I played the lockout year and then the following year uh, with San Jose and then, and then uh, my, career was up, my, my contract was up with San Jose and uh, my youngest son needed to have some surgery, very personal surgery and we were told that we should find the best possible person we could to do the surgery and we, I, we identified three people, one in Toronto, one in Los Angeles and one in Kansas City. And I couldn't get contracts in Toronto or LA. They were in a bit of a youth movement. I was 33 at the time. And uh, so I signed in Kansas City because my son needed surgery. And it was a long convalescence period. And so best decision I ever made from, because he's doing wonderfully today. But, but I ended up signing in San Jose. And the coach of the team, my, well, first of all, my very first roommate ever in the National Hockey League was, was a goaltender named Doug Sotar in Winnipeg. He was the general manager of the Kansas City team. The coach of the team uh, was Paul McLean, uh, who I played in Winnipeg, and the assistant coach was Usain Dabua, my captain in Winnipeg. So it was a real good connection for me there. So uh, in any event, uh, we were supposed to play against Gordie Howe when he was playing uh, in Detroit with the Detroit Vipers. <laughs> and this is a true stuff, and I ended up I ended up breaking my hand in a fight and or breaking the finger in training camp, so I didn't play in that game. And I know Gordie Howe was uh, a lovely man and great, but, but I was going to smoke him if I was going to play in that game. 
honest to God, I said, what the hell is he just, he was just servicing the game by playing in that game. I honestly, he was disrespecting the game. If you're going to lace up, you're going to lace up and, gonna, and you just want to set a record because you're a certain age, then you're going to pay the price for it. Unfortunately, I didn't play that game. <laughs> <laughs> so I was getting ready and uh, October 27th, 97, I was leaving uh, practice in, in uh, the Kemper Arena in Kansas City and somebody ran a stop sign and T-bowed me on the door. My driver's door, my car flipped three times and I'm just happy to be here. Uh, and I ended up with severe post-concussion syndrome. Uh, Lori was there, if you could uh, live in infamy on YouTube. Um, I fought Joey Kosher three times in my career. First time, you know, basically no contest, I ended up beating him. Second time was a bit of a wrestling match. Third time, uh, we're in the Joe Louis Arena and I cross-checked Stevie Y really good. <laughs> <laughs> right in front of the Detroit bench. And uh, Joey came over the boards. I knew exactly what I was doing. I mean, uh, uh, but I knew Joey was coming over the bench. If it wasn't Joey, it was going to be about Probert. But um, uh, just the way he grabbed me, and uh, I, it, I just saw this big, huge haymaker come out, and I put my head down to just absorb it into my helmet. And I don't, that's the last thing I remember. Is I, was let, I was knocked out on my feet. Joey hit me two more times on the way down. And... Um, but that, so that, uh, I, I marked out, I got, I got up and I fell back down on the ice again because our trainer Chuck was this old Korean uh, medic uh, who uh, was a wonderful man, but you know, he wasn't holding me. I fell back down, made it look really, really bad. I got into the dressing room, the Detroit asked, the, the Detroit doctor asked me, I said, I said it's 4-1, uh, it's, it's 5-0-1 left in the third period. He said, oh, he's fine, he's ready to go. I played the very next night in, in St. Louis. I never missed a game. I never missed a game. Joey missed two weeks with a bad hand. <laughs> so I won the fight, right? Uh, <laughs> no, but when you talk about concussions today, you know, I should never have seen the ice. If, it was, if I was playing today, I wouldn't probably see the ice for six weeks. I had a headache for six weeks, but they just, the coach just came to me and said, can you play? And they said, yeah, Dan Maloney, uh, who's tough as nails when he played. And you, yeah, coach, I can play. You never, the, the, the player is the last person you ask if uh, they can play because you know, you're just going to say yes, even if you're playing in pain. But my career, I'm getting back to your story. Uh, so I got smoked in a car accident. I had to recuperate, did a whole bunch of... Uh, um, uh, from a concussion perspective, I'd stand up and I'd fall flat back on my face. I'd try to go through the doorway, I'd hit the doorway. I uh, almost had to wear a helmet at home because I, I, my proprioceptiveness was all off. And uh, one of the th and so that's, that's uh, October all the way through. There's a little minor league, there's a clause in the minor league contract. If a, player's, if a player um, suffers a season ending, non-hockey related injury, they had the ability to terminate the contract. So Kansas City cut me uh, in January, and I said, how can you do that? The season's not over yet. But a, you know, the doctors are saying that he was pretty well toast. I went to see Dr. James Kelly in June of that year, who at that time was the most foremost concussion expert, uh, and he told me that he would never play me to keep, clear me to play hockey again. So instead of having 30 general managers in the NHL and 30 in the, in the minors and maybe 30 in the East Coast League and all the general managers in Europe say, get lost, Kate, you're not good enough anymore, I just had a doctor say, you're not allowed to play anymore. So it was very clean cut. I put all, so I was recuperating. I did a, uh, I went to see a neuropsychologist here in town. I did a test that took me five days to do. In, and that was uh, in June of 98. In, no, July of 98. In July of 99, that same test took me three hours to do. So I was pretty messed up. And one of the things I started to do, because I would screw up my, my language, my, my thoughts and so forth, is I started to write. And I never took any training and so forth, but I ended up calling, uh, it's, it's amazing how things happen. There was a, a radio show here in Ottawa on Team 1200, and the two guys on the radio were roasting, roasting Tom Barrasso. And who I played with Tom. And I guess it, Otto, Brasso was playing with Ottawa, and it was right out, he was coming off the ice, he had stood on his head, 
And Scott Oak stuck a microphone in his face and asked him a really stupid question. I don't know what it was, but Tom, Tom uh, is a proud guy, and he just uh, he, he had a pretty curt, curt, uh, curt response to him. Anyways, they were roasting him, so I called up the radio show. And uh, I said, do, do you guys, do you guys ever met Tom Barrasso? No. Have you ever been in the Ottawa Senator's dressing room? No. And how can you make such personal comments about somebody that you've never met? Oh, yeah, it, 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 I played with Tom. Oh, who is this? I said, it's Jim Kite. I played with him at Pittsburgh. Click. They hang up on me. And they went on and on. And I called back and I said, you, you, you put me back on the air. I said, no, we're not putting you back on the air. <laughs> but I got about five phone calls. And one of them was from, um, oh, concussion moment. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Bob McRae, who was Earl McRae's son. I don't know if you're Earl McRae, but Bob McRae had a website called The Sport Faculty. He was starting. He asked me, he said, were you just on the radio? And I said, is this Jim Kite? And I said, yes. Yeah. I said, I'd love for you if you'd write a column for me. Or if you want to and write whenever you want. So I said, okay. So I thought about it. And, and so I just started writing. At that time, Eric Lindros was having some concussion issues. I was living through that as well. And... Um, so I wrote my first piece for the sport faculty, and the next thing you know, the Ottawa Citizen found out, and they asked me if I would write a column for the Ottawa Citizen. So that's how it all started, and um, I really loved the platform of being, I had a weekly column in the Citizen for four seasons. Every Saturday, it was called The Point Man, and I really, I had, uh, the, the sports editor said, well, you got about 800, 800, 800, 900 words, and I said, okay, great. So I started writing my first piece, and I'm writing it, and I haven't made my point yet, and I do word count, I'm at 1,500 words. I go, ooh. So I said, it was a real education for me, whittling down, whittling down, whittling down. I got it down to about 850 some odd words, and it was a great experience for me, and, um, so that allowed me to transition, and, was, and I do corporate speaking because of my, my history of being the only le legally deaf player. I'm a champion for accessibility. And uh, then Algonquin Fo College found out, uh, had an idea, there was a dean there, new dean of, of doing a graduate program in sport business management, related to the business of sport, uh, and asked me if I'd be on the advisory committee. So I said, sure. So I got a blue ribbon and panel of, of people from the Director General of Sport Canada, the head of the Canadian Olympic Committee, Cyril Leader from the Senators, Jeff Hunt from the 67s, Brad Waters from the Renegades at the time. And I handed everything over to the college to develop. And the person who developed the program ended up leaving for a family emergency in Edmonton. And so I said, what needs to happen? And I saw a window this big because I know there's a lot of players who struggle post-career. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, and um, I saw an opportunity and I dove straight through and I worked probably 100, 120 hours a week trying to make it happen. And uh, I was given an opportunity. And um, you could come into my home today and you wouldn't see any hockey memorabilia at all. I walk into some of my teammates. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't have any either. <laughs> it's like walking into a Hall of Fame. Yeah. And hockey is something that I may have been, I did for a living, but it's not who I am. Right? And there's a lot of hockey players who think, I'm a hockey player. That's what, that's what I do. And I said, you have to take the, you take the focus it took to get yeah. to become a National Hockey League player, and you refocus it into another area, you should be able to be successful in it. Uh, and um, so I've been very fortunate, and I had a very long-winded answer, I'm sorry, but um, not as long as his, but uh, it, uh, it was a, uh, it's been an interesting transition, and who knows what, what the future holds, but uh, it's I fun. it's wonderful, it's very inspirational. So um, on that note, because they're both so long-winded, I mean, because they're such a great <laughs> uh, speaking personally, thank you so much for taking time out of your weekend. Um, we've kind of lost the opportunity for formal question period, but hopefully you guys will stick around a little bit. Each of you in your kits have a photograph of each of these men. We're able, thanks to courtesy the Hockey Hall of Fame, and Kevin facilitated that. Uh, that's a photo of Jim on ice with Senators. That's a rarity. I very rare one. one. He's never even seen it. 
So thank you to Kevin and Craig Campbell and Aki all shame for that. So gentlemen, hopefully you'll be willing to stick around for a little bit and maybe a few people can ask a few questions. But between 12 and 1 is our scheduled lunch uh, time as well. So at your leisure, you can make your way to the cafeteria. There's nothing formal. Uh, so I'll let you decide how you want to split your time. So back to you, Julie. Thank you so much. And on behalf of the society, I just want to present each of you a copy of our, our book, oh, wow. Puck Roar. That came out a, a while ago now. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. Thanks very much. It was great. And again, thank you for joining us. And uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it as much as I did. And um, sorry, we don't have formal time for questions, but of course, I'm sure they'll, they'll gladly stick around. Oh, and we have Sharpies somewhere for the, for the autographs. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, John. We don't, we don't have time for any more stories. Uh, I, 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 I tell you one quick story here about Jimmy before we wrap up, and I know you guys are, are sick of hearing us, but so because uh, we, had, we had a guy in, in who was drafted in 1979 named Perry Turnbull. I think he, Rob Ramage was one, I think Perry Turnbull was two. It was the same draft year that I was. So Perry Turnbull, six foot two, he's about 225 pounds, what they would call today as a power forward. And Perry Turnbull, was his wife was Nancy, and my wife is Nancy, and Jimmy's wife is Nancy now. So all three now. Anyway, so this is back in the day where we had roommates. Okay, nowadays the guys don't have roommates unless you're a raw rookie, then you have to have a roommate. But so, anyways, Perry Turnbull was this six foot two, two hundred three pound guy that was scared of the dark. Okay, like like literally, he'd have a light on and he'd have his TV on all the time, and he was going through roommates. Guys would go, I can't. I can't uh, room with Percy's. Like uh, uh, at two in the morning, I got up to go to the bathroom and turned the TV off. And he woke up and said, "Turn the and TV back on." And, and when we got uh, this was after our first road trip, we we got back home and asked his wife Nancy. Nancy, he's not like this at home, eh? And he, she goes, "Yep. At home, we have a TV on and we have to have a light on. That's just his. He, he was afraid of the dark. Okay, so." Nobody wanted to room with Percy. So what happened is they, they bring Jimmy in and say, Jimmy, you're going to be his roommate. So what happened? Here's how they remedied the situation. Kiter uh, took his hearing aids out so he couldn't hear the TV, couldn't hear anything like that. He wore one of those masks and stuff like that. <laughs> and so the deal was is Percy just had to make sure he answered the phone in the morning to get the wake-up call uh, because otherwise he'd sleep through it. And that's how they remedied the situation. He could have all these lights on and stuff, and Kiter had took his hearing aid, put the mask on, and they were roommates. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, there's lots of there's lots of those stories. Or, or I got another one. Well, <laughs> thank you so much. Okay.